Hello, Peter Letterman here. It's the afternoon of April 16 on a bit of a chilly day in Philadelphia. I hope everyone is well. I hope everyone is safe. And this is the most recent in a series I'm doing to just give you my thoughts on what's going on. I'm not suggesting I am right, but at least I'm thoughtful. And in so doing, I can help you be a bit more thoughtful and think through for yourself what's the best situation for you. Um, let me give a statement as a start, which is we are now in the worst economic situation in the United States since probably uh, 1931, perhaps 1938, uh, as the data is done, we'll know. It is not the worst in terms of death rates in the United States, all sources of death. And in fact, the first 25 years of my life had higher death rates per thousand people than we are experiencing today or we would be experiencing today even if uh, we hadn't taken no actions against the coronavirus. Um, the, as a kind of benchmark of everything, we've lost about $760 billion of GDP since the end of the first week of March. Um, this is a 3.6% decline in GDP, which if you were to annualize it, which is the way people normally report it, would be a 36% roughly decline in GDP. The unemployment claims came out today, but remember those numbers are already a week old. And my estimate is the unemployment rate is running somewhere between 17 and 20 percent as we sit here today on uh, April 16 and rising at the rate of probably six million a week and will that means that we have about 27 million unemployed today versus five million unemployed the end of the first week of March and I think a week from now, we could well have uh, e even even more. Um, the chance of death from the coronavirus is becoming clearer. And basically what is being found is that less than 1% of all the deaths are by people who have no pre-existing medical condition, no pre-existing cancer, diabetes, hypertension, uh, heart situation, respiratory situation. And it is less than 1%. The media will show you that less than 1% to frighten you. But all of the data coming out is that less than 1% have no pre-existing medical condition. Um, it actually isn't even about age, because if you don't have pre-existing medical conditions, age is not in and of itself killing people. It is that a lot of the aged have these pre-existing medical conditions. And in fact, I saw that in Pennsylvania, more than half of all the people who have died live in uh, retirement facilities. And if you visited if a retirement facility, you could probably pick out the people who would be dying if they caught it. And you could pick out the ones in that facility who would not be dying if they caught it. Um, at this moment, uh, actually on the death rates, one more thing is that the best evidence is that essentially less than 1% if you have no pre-existing conditions. About 25% of the dead have one pre-existing medical condition. 
About 25% have two pre-existing medical conditions and 49.5% have three or more pre-existing medical conditions. Um, which is to say, if you're in good health, you're very unlikely to die of this. That doesn't mean you may not get it and have a, a bad time with it. Though it appears that 80 to 90% of the people who have it are either asymptomatic or very mild symptoms. But those that have it badly, have it quite badly. I, at this moment, there are about 34,000 deaths in the United States from the virus, or of people who had the virus in them. And given the pre-existing medical conditions, the exact attribution of death is difficult, though they're all being counted as deaths. Uh, if my mother would have gotten the disease three weeks before she passed away from four or five pre-existing conditions that she had had for several years, she would be counted as one of those deaths, even though she was dying in a matter of weeks and days. So you have to bear that in mind. So the best estimates I've seen are that about half of the deaths are of people who would not have died anyway in 2000, in, in 2020. That is to say, we're probably at around 17,000 deaths of people who would not have died in 2020, though many of them would have died because of their pre-existing conditions in 2021. As a benchmark against the 34,000 deaths, remember we have about 2.8 million deaths a year in the United States. And in fact, basically each year over the last six years prior to this virus, the number of deaths was up by about 230,000 a year versus um, the previous eight years due to suicides, drug abuse, and chronic disease, uh, diabetes, obesity-related diseases, heart-related diseases, respiratory diseases, 230,000 more. Uh, so we went from the lowest death rates from 2008 through 2013 in basically recorded history, and it rose dramatically to the tune of about 10% almost each of those last years as these chronic diseases and suicide and drug deaths exploded. Um, and again, that compares to 34,000 deaths so far from this disease. And uh, remember, not all of those are net deaths. Turning to real estate, the value of real estate, as best you can tell on Wall Street, because there are basically no trades in the private market, all those transactions have basically fallen apart, including a number of high profile um, deals where people have walked away from hard deposits, substantial hard deposits. But if you look at real estate values, on Wall Street, they're down somewhere between 20 and 40%. Uh, the only exception of any magnitude would be digital, which is actually up slightly in value over that time period. But the tra more traditional property categories are down 25, 20 to 40%. I did a simulation, and this is just math, that said what used to be, imagine doing a discounted cash flow on the value of a property that's generating 100 this year, and then it was going to generate 103 the next year, and then 3% higher the next year, and then 3% higher the next year, et cetera. And then you truncated it out at a 20 multiple uh, value, 
uh, six years out, a five cap, if you will, six years from now. And then you discounted all those cash flows at 7%. And then I compared that discounted cash flow to a situation where the value of uh, the cash flow dropped to zero this year, went to 40 in 2021, went to 80 in 2022, went to 100 in 2023, and then by 2024 had caught up to where it would have been if it grew from today for 3% a year. So it was a basically a four-year drop and then but a big drop down to zero cash flow all right and uh if you keep the same discount rate that cash stream drops in value in present value by about nine percent and that's because perpetuity is a long time and things do recover uh, after 9-11, no one was ever going to travel again. Hotels would never be needed. Uh, people were just not going to go to conferences, etc. And then that turned out not to be true. And during the financial crisis, similar statements were made, and that turned out not to be true. And I have a feeling the same thing is going to be true here. And in fact, I think the longer people stay home, the more you're going to see travel and leisure pick up on the other side, particularly as we figure out how operationally to deal with the disease. Um, the, but the 20 to 40% value drops, you can only generate at most about uh, uh, nine percentage points of it coming from the cash flows being down. And in fact, what you then do is you tweak it and say, suppose the cash flows are down. How high does the discount rate have to be to wipe out 30% of the value? I just kind of took the midpoint. How high does it have to be to wipe out 30% value? And the answer is the discount rate has to go from 7% to 40%. And that's the swing from greed to fear. And I'm not trying to make any of these numbers precise. It's not like the discount rate was 7 and it currently is 40. But what the point is, is that the bulk of the swing in value that's occurred is reflective of not reduced cash flows in the next few years, but rather a swing that's massive in the rate at which you discount cash flows. And people are much more fearful about the future. They're clinging to safety, hence low treasury rates. And that is what's driven it. And you had that um, when you go back to the 70s, when the oil embargo happened, you had it in 80, 81, 82 during the recession. You had it again in 90, 91, 92 during the recession. You had it again after 9-11. You had it again after the financial crisis. And I think you have it again. So the key is you've got to weather the storm with your cash flows and not get squeezed out either on no coverage because you're not allowed to operate or people aren't paying their rents because they're shut down and on can you get forbearance because values will recover and that's because cash flows will recover but more importantly there will come a time when fear will start its swing back to greed you don't have prolonged periods where that doesn't occur. And I only do this to give you an order of magnitude of what's involved. Looking at real estate sectors, um, these are kind of as best I can get. Retail sector rent collections, depending on the property and depending on the quality of the property, are running somewhere between 30 and 60 percent uh, rent through the first part of April. Um, obviously, if you have supermarket, drugstore, uh, you've done a better job of collecting. And obviously, if those rents 
or a higher percentage of the property's income, you've done much better. But obviously, there are a lot of tenants not paying rent, working on forbearance. And as I've said, I don't know that you got a lot of choice but to work with them for forbearance. On the office side, it appears that somewhere between 40 and 85% of rents have been collected through the first two weeks of April. Again, depending on the nature of the tenants, those that are able to conduct businesses viably, being much more likely to pay rent than the retail on a lower level, for example, that isn't allowed to operate, uh, depending on location and tenant quality. On apartments, the lowest I've heard is 65% of rent has been collected. More typically, I'm hearing something in the 93 to 99% of rents are being collected in April. Um, the lowest numbers appear to be occurring in very low affordability markets like coastal California, um, where the amount of money being paid is substantial. And I think people are probably husbanding in more, quote, affordable situations. It appears the rents are being quite well collected. Moving to industrial properties, again, very much depending on the nature of your tenants, somewhere between 50% and 95% of rents are being collected. If you've got Amazon, you're obviously collecting. If you've got a retailer that's on the edge and has been shut down for seven weeks, you're not likely collecting. Hotels, simplest statement is they're dead. Um, they've not been effectively allowed to operate. There's, yes, there's a little bit, but not been allowed to operate. Um, and it's going to be a slow recovery there, but hotels are not a dead concept. Um, they've been around going back to the time of, of uh, the Egyptians, and they're not going to disappear. And in fact, as this thing becomes under better control and better understood and better managed, um, they will come back. And I remind people of after 9-11, no one was ever going to leave their loved ones again. Um, I think the best assurance that people will travel again and, and, and move is the time they had to spend with their loved ones hit the point where, okay, um, I saw a very cute, I'm sure you've all seen a million of these type where, uh, an interviewer asked someone, uh, would you rather um, A, be isolated with your family or B, 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 I'd much rather have B as the initial answer. And that sets in on all sides. A couple of observations um, uh, or speculations. Uh, right now, everybody... Uh, is saying that online retail, online retail, online retail, this is going to speed up the future. Online retail, there's going to just kill all the bricks. Online retail, and by the way, Netflix and Netflix and all those, and they're going to do great, and they're going to do great. Well, let me give an alternative. The dirty secret, and I've written about this, and, and most of those in the business know, the dirty secret is Online retail does not make money of products that have to be handled. I don't mean a product like a song that can be sent over digitally. But physical products, particularly low margin physical products, lose money online. And they lose it no matter who's doing it. You just can't make the math work on low margin items to cover the handling cost and the shipping cost overnight, in not in bulk. There's a reason that bulk shipping is efficient. And self-procurement, namely you go to the store rather than the product coming to you. You go to the store while you're in the area. There's a reason why that evolved. Online does not make money. And I'll extend it to somebody like Netflix. Netflix has got a lot of people viewing, but they do not make money. It's a simple observation. They do not make money. I think one of the things that's going to happen in the next few months is, yep, there's a lot of online sales right now. 
It simply means the online retailers are losing more and more money because every item they ship, they lose more. They're not making it up in volume. They're multiplying their losses in volume. And the appetite for companies that are losing money goes down dramatically when profits drop. And it goes down dramatically when uh, funds are losing money rather than making money. And you've seen it in the soft bank. I'll take the most visible. SoftBank's appetite to continue to fund losers is notably down, and they were the most aggressive in funding losers. So the appetite by capital sources to fund losers, whether it's the debt market or the equity market, I think goes way down. That will actually set online sales back substantially because absent the ability to lose money and having somebody funding that, they have a real problem and they're going to have to actually search for a model that makes money either by raising the price or limiting the products that they try to sell to higher margin items that can take the handling charges. In the same way, uh, Netflix, yep, you got a lot of people watching, but they're losing money and the appetite to help them lose money goes down in times like this. Not to mention that when you have 20 to 30% unemployment, a lot of people start looking at Netflix as a luxury rather than a necessity. Um, and I think you're going to see the demand go down over time and the willingness of capital to fund them. So what appears at first glance as a, an inflection point for these online could end up actually be a very negative thing for them. Um, another thought is you get a lot of uh, headline about WeWorks and their difficulties and other co-working companies and their space because who wants to work elbow to elbow at a butcher block table in a shared workspace. But I think the issue is actually broader than that. The issue is broader than that in that many traditional tenants in the last five years have for their own use adopted that layout. Now, I can't tell you the number of companies where I've walked through their recently reconfigured space that is outfitted with no traditional offices and butcher block tables, no traditional workstations, but um, hot seat butcher block tables, and they're very proud of it. They put a lot of money into it. Well, I think that layout, whether it's co-working company or a layout within a traditional firm for their own space is dead and is going to have to be redone and rethought. And the traditional office and the traditional distancing from others while I work is roaring back and will reverse the downward trend in uh, space per worker quite dramatically. And people say, well, everybody's going to work from home. Everybody's not going to work from home. How many of you can honestly say this has been as efficient for your company as if you were all there in the traditional way? It can be more efficient for some things. For example, my dictating this is more efficient in a home office. But let's be honest, I used to do this type of stuff at home anyway. But on the other hand, we have a loan processing for a PPP loan that I have to scramble around and try to find people and emails and four phone calls, whereas if we were there, we'd have had it all dealt with in five minutes. So I don't think home officing is the way for most people. It's always been something some people have used. Um, and it's much more difficult to remain to maintain work ethic and work morale remotely than it is face-to-face. -face. Um, 
Another thing is, it, it is essential that we, in my view, open up the economy and we do it fast. We need the creativity of the private sector, all of us individually, each trying to figure out what is the best way to protect my workers and my customers, given my particular location, given my particular office, given my particular store, given my particular hotel. We need the private sector with all of its ingenuity and creativity solving that, solving those problems, kind of figuring out the right solutions rather than having a bureaucratic government agency trying to figure it out. There's a reason central planning has never worked as an economic model, and that's because there are too many variations out there in the economy. And the notion that we're going to, we, the government, are going to tell you how to open up rather than you figuring out what is safe for your workers, what is safe for your customers. None of you are trying to kill your customers. None of you are trying to kill your workers. Quite the opposite. You don't benefit from killing your customers and workers. And I'd rather have tens, hundreds of thousands of companies trying to figure out the right way rather than big bureaucratic sitting around trying to say what is the best way. There is no best way. There are probably tens of thousands of best ways depending on the situation. And uh, the government could never figure them all out. Open up the economy and free that creativity, not only the creativity to do business, but the creativity of how best to deal with this. There may be guidelines issued based on the best medical information available that might say, those of you with pre-existing conditions, we highly recommend that you and your employer or you think about, do I really want to be going to the store? Do I really want to be doing it? Certainly if I have three pre-existing conditions, it might be a good idea. You don't go to the basketball game. But to prohibit across the board makes no sense in terms of the data. We're basically isolating everybody to deal with 10 to 15 percent of the population. And there's no reason to punish people that way. I would gladly, as a 69-year-old, I self-isolate to some degree I don't have any pre-existing conditions, but I'd gladly isolate if it allowed the rest of the economy, the rest of my employees I care about, the rest of my customers I care about, get back to work. The economic damage, which as I've said is about 20 to 21 billion a day, is actually growing. It's probably closer to 25 billion a day, and that's because you're getting knock-on effects. You're getting not only the directly shut down being hurt, but now you're getting the fact that since they're shut down, they can't be customers for you. They can't buy your products. They can't be advertising. They can't be all of these things. In hospitals, hospitals are not shut down. They just shut down a whole lot of quote, non-essential stuff, like having a hip replaced. Well, somebody who's had two hips replaced, it's more essential than you might think. And most hospitals are sitting empty, even though you see on television the 1% that are overwhelmed. Um, most hospitals are sitting empty. We sit right out our door is the University of Pennsylvania Hospital and Thomas Jefferson Hospital. And when you walk through them uh, or by them, it's like Christmas Day, quiet. There's nothing happening. And that's because all, and normally they're a buzz with activity. So we've got to, we've got to stop the economic damage from accelerating. There will be people who die. There's no way to get around that. There are going to be people who are going to get sick every year. 2.8 million people die in general. We deal with that. We've dealt with higher death rates overall 
than would be the result of this being part of our death pattern. We've lived with it. As I said, we lived with it the first 25 years of my life, a death rate that would be about the same as the death rate, including um, coronavirus. We figured out how. I think it's also important that people realize you read the paper and you watch these pundits and people say, oh, this is going to benefit and this is going to benefit and this is going to really do great. And I step back and say that if the economy falls 25 to 30 percent and employment is around 30, unemployment, excuse me, is around 30 percent, nobody benefits. You may be harmed less. Oh, sure. Bankruptcy types probably do better, but in a systemic way, almost nothing can benefit from a world where an economy falls by 25, 30%, and one out of every three people is unemployed. It's just impossible. A couple of other things. One is I do not view what the government's doing as bailouts. I don't view it as a stimulus. That's the verbiage being given to it. I am opposed to bailouts. I'm opposed to stimulus. There's no evidence that either of them work as anything more than transfers. So what is all this money being spent like? This money is much more akin to what happens when the government comes and takes my property from me in order to build a school. And rather than negotiating with me, they take it. Well, they have the right under the Constitution to take my property for a public purpose. Whether I agree with the purpose or not, whether I think it's a smart policy or not, they, the government, have that right. But the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution says that they must give you compensation. And what you've seen happen in the last seven weeks at a hotel for workers for gambling casinos, for many, many walks of life, for restaurants, is the government for a social purpose. And forget whether you think they did the right thing or the wrong thing. It's a legitimate social good that they were trying to achieve. Took your property. They took your business and shut it down. They took your means of earning a living and forbade it. And that is a taking. Now, whether it would end up in court that anybody would make it a taking, I don't know. But intellectually, it is a taking, as surely as if they came taking my land to build a school. So this is really more akin to Fifth Amendment compensation for taking, being done really fast rather than waiting six, seven years going through court, really fast. And I think it's smart, it's going really fast, and very rough. In other words, where if it's my, my land and we're doing a school and we get three appraisers and we go through court and they all argue about what are the assumptions and what are the comps, and we, we would. We'd come up with a, a much more just compensation doing that than the rough justice that's going on through PPP or the increased unemployment payments, or, or, or. And they're not fully just because they don't compensate the high earners as much as they compensate the low earners. But as a rough pass of justice, in terms of Fifth Amendment taking of my property, of my livelihood, of my business, it is the right thing for society being to do. And this from someone who basically believes Government should not bail out and government should not uh, try to stimulate because there's no evidence stimulus works and there's no evidence that bailouts do anything other than protect people from their own misjudgments. It's not the restaurant is going out of business because of its misjudgments. They were told they could not operate by the government. That's a taking. And I think that intellectual framework is important and I've not heard others pointed out. Uh, last or two last points. One is that I get asked a lot, well, how are we going to pay for all this intervention? How are we going to pay for it? Look, society's made a choice. 
uh, much as if we decided to build a school, we made a choice on a social policy. And we made a choice that it was worth it. You may disagree whether it was worth it or not, but we made a choice. Having made that choice, we're putting, uh, we're upping our outstanding debt probably by 10% over the next year. Now, how do we pay for that? First of all, the world is awash with money, including central banks and uh, foreign treasuries from abroad, as well as our own, who are willing to accept U.S. government paper for essentially no return. I think the short rate today is like is like uh, 20 basis points and the 10 year is something like 70 basis points and the 30 year is 1.3 or something like that. If the world is willing to give us that money at that pricing, we should take it. And in fact, my view is if we're doing this, as a long-term phenomena, as a long-term good, we should be matching our financing to deal with it. We shouldn't be doing short-term debt to fund this. We shouldn't even be doing three to five-year debt. We should be doing 30-year debt. This is we're making a generational salvation, and we should be taking and matching the salvation, if you will, to the funding, and that would be quite long-term debt. That's one way, is we're going to borrow it. And people say, well, but we're also printing money. The Fed is pumping a lot of money into the system, and we're just printing money. And people say, well, won't that cause inflation? Yes, but in a very odd way. And the odd way is the shutdown has created enormous excess capacity in almost every sector overnight. And in fact, you're going to see prices go down for almost everything. Your rents are going to go down. Wages are going to go down. You're going to see prices go down for almost everything. And the money they're pumping in is not going to be that prices are going up. It's going to be that they're going to go down a little less because of the money being pumped into the system until that excess capacity gets absorbed. So yes, it is inflationary, but it's inflationary in a fundamentally uh, and artificially created deflationary environment. So you're not going to get runaway inflation. You're just going to get a bit less deflation from the money being pumped into the system. And the third is, we'll tax, raise taxes and pay for it. Well, nobody has the appetite when the unemployment rate is one in five not working and GDP is shrinking 5% in seven weeks and nobody, nobody, not even the most ardent tax and spend person is saying now is the time to talk about how do we do it through taxes. That conversation will come and it'll probably come as the recovery is well underway and it'll depend on who wins the election in uh, November uh, both in Congress and in, in the White House. But eventually there will be a conversation about taxes. And the one thing that's been clear about taxes uh, is that the zero, the effective zero tax bracket will continue to creep up. That is to say, the income at which you can earn and effectively pay no federal tax will continue to creep up and the tax on the highest half of the income distribution, particularly the very high half of the income distribution, will continue to rise. And I don't know when that happens, I don't know how it happens, but that day will come. So don't be shocked when it does. Um, but in the near term, it's going to be printing money and borrowing with a discussion about taxes yet to come. The last thing is crude estimates I have done indicate that the every net life we're saving, that is, I net out the people who would have died anyway in the next few months, the cost in terms of lost GDP for net life saved looks like at best it will end up 30 to $60 million per life saved. And 
if you think about it, you know that it has to be that order of magnitude because if you're going to shut down 20 to 30 percent of the economy and at most save half a percent of the population, it's got to be a huge multiple. Uh, just mathematically. And all I've done is do the math to a little more precision, but only time will tell. This is not a matter of dollars, though, versus lives. It's a matter of, do children get educated? Do people get to see their loved ones? Do they get to see their loved ones when they die, if they so choose? Do they get to travel? Do they get to exercise their rights? Do they get to run their businesses that they've established and lead their careers and interact with their family in the way they choose to do? That is the choice. Lives are going to be lost any way you think about it. We lose lives all of my life and we'll lose lives all of the rest of my life. The question is, are we going to allow individuals to have the choice of how to deal with those losses of life and get on with their life? With that, I hope all of you are doing well, and I hope all of you are surviving economically, and I appreciate your interest and wish you the best. Thank you.